to church this morning at Benson Global Methodist Church. We invite you to join us as we begin singing. Uh, the words will be on the screen, so please stand up in our call to worship. Good morning. Friends, our, our call to worship uh, is a responsive reading that comes to us from the Old Testament, from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, Moses and the burning bush. The reading is found on the front of your bulletin and also on the screen as well. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will no longer see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, Here I am. Take off your sandals, for this place where you are standing is holy ground. 
And indeed, friends, even as we come together in this familiar place, we greet one another this morning, we rejoice in the fellowship of the Spirit of God, and this is uh, a holy place, a place that we have set aside for the worship of our God. I invite you to stand and for us to join together in our hymn of praise, Holy, 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 which is found on page 64 and also on the screens as well. congregation you may be seated. Friends, who has some good news to share with us this morning? A good word to encourage us today? I am already running over with good news that I am excited about because my mama is here and that is nice uh, that my mom does not often get to, uh, to come and visit because she lives in Chapel Hill and uh, I'm usually occupied on Sunday mornings, so it'd make it that much harder to get her here uh, for a Sunday morning service. So we are uh, grateful to her friend, family friend Carol uh, to provide transportation and uh, also excited about hearing our youngest son proclaim the gospel this morning. Um, this is not Jaden's last Sunday with us. It is his second to last Sunday, and we will be uh, taking him off to uh, the faraway and exotic land of Wilmore, Kentucky, in <laughs> central Kentucky, um, at the end of the month. And so we're, we're excited about that. 
Um, among some of the folks that we have been in prayer for, uh, we have recently been in prayer for little Grayley Jo Thornton. Um, she is an, an infant and still in uh, the pediatric ICU at Duke. Um, and we continue to be in prayer for her. She is making some progress. And so the latest on, on the, the family's Facebook page is that um, she has some fluid on her left lung that they are hoping that they can treat with medication and avoid needing to do anything surgical there. But for us to be uh, and continue to be in prayer for little Grayley Jo and her family. Um, also learned this morning that uh, Bob Tart's mother-in-law, Renina Tart's mother, Ms. Rachel Johnson is still in the hospital, so for us uh, to continue to lift her up in prayer. Who else might we lift up in prayer this morning? Yes, Henry. Uh, Julia Johnson's family. Okay, Julia Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry, Judy Johnson family. Okay. Yes, Carol. Okay. Oh, gee. All right. So praise for, for Jay's recovery uh, from, from uh, throwing out his back. Okay. Yes, Tracy. Okay. The family of Jennifer Patterson. And that we might, oh, yes, uh, Teresa. Okay. Okay. So prayers for prayers for her. Her name is Peyton. Peyton. Okay. Prayers for prayers for Peyton and newborn, uh, also in the hospital and and dealing with some complications there. So prayers for her. Yes, David. Uh, Betty Aiken family. Okay. Prayers for Ms. Betty Aiken and family. All right, family of Barbara Lancaster and Johnny. Okay, so uh, prayers for the McClam family and uh, over the, the passing of Gordon's sister. All right. And yes, yes, it is. It is, it is nice to have Glenn Sutton. Uh, who is our longest commuting church member. And I'll tell you folks, nobody's got an excuse for missing church. If Glenn can get here from Colorado to be here for our 11 o'clock service, anybody out there in the internet, shame on you for sleeping in this morning. You get to church, all right? We miss you when you're not here, but it is great uh, to have Glenn with us this morning. Uh, we continue to be in prayer for uh, the numbers of friends and family that are battling with cancer, and in particular, we want to continue to lift up Joey Maples, Paula Daniels, Archie Holcomb, uh, Scott Barnes, and Chris Miller. Also, uh, a special prayer request regarding um, Beth Harrison's Aunt Shirley uh, Acree, and that she has recently entered hospice care. And uh, so that is, that is um, Beth and Ricky's aunt, Shirley. Yes. Oh yes. Okay, Janelle. What if what what would you like to share? Thank you, Cynthia. Um, the book um, that event mm -hmm. yesterday at the fire department was um, wonderful. We were so blessed with so many wonderful help from our church and from the community, and there were five hundred and three um, students that were served. So wow. That really, that really is. That's fantastic. Okay. That's great. So 503 area students benefiting from our, our school supply drive. And that is uh, certainly, friends, for us to also be in prayer for not only students, but our other uh, educators and administrators as we are 
getting that much closer to school starting up. Let's join our hearts together in prayer this morning. Lord Jesus, we are thankful for uh, the body of Christ, for our life together, Lord, and for how you are present with us. Uh, present with us on a Sunday morning when we gather together and worship. Lord, you are present with us even when we are uh, away from this place, when we're at home, when we're at school, when we're at work. Uh, there is never truly a time where any of us are alone uh, because you are present there with us. And Lord, we give you thanks for the way that you are on the move here among us. We pray, Lord, that you will continue to grow our faith that our expectations of you will grow and that we will look forward to how you are at work uh, in the hearts and lives of people right here in this building, but Lord, also that you are at work in the world around us. And may we have faith to respond in obedience to you, uh, to pursue your holiness, to lift up the names even as we have, Lord, mentioned uh, the names of so many that have been sick, uh, whether in or out of the hospital. Uh, Lord, we ask that you will continue to grow our faith and our trust in you. Um, that, Lord, even the, the grief of death is not so great uh, that you cannot grow in our hearts uh, a faith and trust in you, the hope and promise of the resurrection morning. Uh, Lord, that, that you would be at work to heal those that are sick of body, to encourage those that are sick of heart, and Lord, uh, that we might all rejoice in knowing your presence with us and your desire uh, to be in right relationship with us, even as we join our hearts together now in the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I have never been before. No sad goodbye will there be spoken. For time won't matter anymore. Beulah land, I am longing for you. And someday on thee I'll stand. There shall be eternal Beulah land sweet Beulah land I'm looking now across the river where my faith shall end Inside, there's just a few more days to labor than I will take my heavenly flight. Beulah land, I am lost. And someday on thee I'll stand. There my home shall be eternal.
eternal Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. There my home shall be eternal Beulah land, sweet Beulah Land. I want to go ahead and dismiss the children uh, for Children's Church this morning, and as the children are headed out for uh, their children's church lesson. I want to invite the ushers to come at this time and we'll receive the morning tithes and offerings. for these and all of your gifts. May we be truly thankful for the ways that you demonstrate your love for us. You are faithful in your provision for us. And Lord, we seek your blessing for every household that is represented here, that every heart and mind might be inclined towards you. And Lord, that we would respond in obedience to the calling that you have placed on our lives. Lord, 
thank you for this day and for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray all of these things in his name. Amen. And congregation, you may be seated. Good morning. (laughs) Our scripture text this morning comes from the New Testament book of Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. This morning we're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. It is found on the screens. It is also printed in your bulletin. However, I do encourage you, we're going to look over some cross-references within Hebrews, so if you can find a physical Bible in the pew around you, you might want that, or if you want to use your cell phone to go onto the Bible app, I invite you to do so. I invite you now to hear the word of the living and the true God. Strive for peace with everyone. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. And that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. Who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward when he desired to inherit the blessing... He was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Thus is the conclusion of the reading of God's holy and inspired word. This is the word of God for us, the people of God, so that we may all say together, thanks be to God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I would just ask that you would move in this place over these next few minutes, Lord. As we go through your word, I pray that your word would pierce our hearts, that we would lay aside any preconceived beliefs or cultural norms, and that we would conform totally and completely to the teachings of Scripture, that we would leave behind and separate ourselves from sin and separate ourselves unto you. Lord, get me out of the way. Put yourself center stage. Steal the show today, Lord. Change and transform us with your grace. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. For those of you who do not know me, and for those of you who do know me but have been wondering where I've been, my name is Jay Nolson. I am the son of Billy and Elaine Olson, sitting right there on the second row. Love them so much, and I'm so honored to be back here with you at Benson, now Global Methodist Church. The last time I was here was Benson United Methodist Church. It was the last Pentecost Sunday of last year. I was able to preach here by the grace of God. And for the last year, for those of you who have been wondering where I am, I have been serving as a youth pastor at Antioch Baptist Church in Mamers, North Carolina. I'm honored to be joined today by some of my youth and their family over here on the second row. The, everyone say, hi, Cotler family. Hi, Cotler family. We're, we're honored to just have them here, and I'm so happy I was honored to be able to baptize Mason Cotler at my last Sunday at Antioch Baptist Church, and I'm just so blessed to have them here, and again, I am so blessed to be with you all this morning. I finished at Antioch at the end of the month of July. And for the last two weeks, I returned to Jellystone Campground in Asheboro, North Carolina. As some of you know, for the last two summers, I served as the activities director at that campground, and I was honored and just had so many fun, wonderful God moments when I was back at the campground these past two weeks. And this past Friday morning, I had a striking conversation with this wonderful family from Florida. And we, as we were talking, uh, we, were, we were playing Gaga Ball for a little bit. For those of you who know what Gaga Ball is, it's kind of like a version of Dodge Ball where you hit a ball around, and if it hits your knee or below, then you're out of the game. You play it in this big sand pit. And I was in there playing with, their, with the kids of this family, and the mother came up to me after the game was over, and she said, now, how did you get that scar on your head? For those of you who don't know, that this is scars that I received in 2018 of September. Suffered a traumatic brain injury. God saved me in a miraculous way. And I was able to share that whole story with them from start to finish. And I was also able to share the gospel with that family. 
And it was just such a wonderful exchange. It's something that came up that was very interesting during that conversation, and it stuck with me ever since Friday morning. It came up to the fact that I, had, that I am now a member of the Global Methodist Church. Now, now this mother had heard of the United Methodist Church, but she, she had heard a, only a little bit about the Global Methodist Church. And, and you know what she asked me? She said, now what's this whole thing about? What, what's the point of this whole new movement? And I, my mind quickly began to race trying to think of some clever one-liner that was going to like summarize and just throw the knockout punch and they'd repent of being Baptist and become global Methodist. But I, that was a joke, by the way. That was a joke, by the way. Hear that, Baptist? That was a joke. Okay. But, <laughs> but I, as I was thinking, I couldn't really come up with one, so I remembered an old quotation from John Wesley. For those of you who do not know, John Wesley is the founder of the Methodist movement. And he was once asked the same question. What is the point, what is the purpose of Methodism? And even John Wesley's answer to that question even transcends Methodism. It goes to the entire point and purpose of the Christian life. Wesley responded by saying this, and I quote, The point of Methodism and the point of this movement is to revive the nation, especially the church, and spread scriptural holiness throughout the land. Close quote. That, in a nutshell, is why I am a global Methodist. Why I am a Methodist, and most of all, it is why I am a Christian. To revive the nation, to revive the church, and to see scriptural holiness and Christ-likeness spread throughout the world. See the Sermon on the Mount become real. Take on flesh in you and me through the Holy Spirit's power. The text that, we, that I, we have this morning is a text that I used in this conversation with this mother and this family to explain Wesley's words. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 14 through 17 capture Wesley's heart to see the land revived, to see the nation changed and the church changed and holiness to spread throughout the land. And it is my charge this morning as a preacher, as a, as a minister of the word of God, as a minister of the gospel to say to you this, this new global Methodist church movement, we can't mess this up guys, like the last movement did. We can't make the same mistakes that we have made before. And even transcending Methodism, we cannot afford to trample underfoot the blood of the covenant by which we were washed. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 and 31. And this chapter gives us a strong warning. It gives a strong warning to this global Methodist movement to not make the same mistakes. And this warning in one simple phrase, if you walk away with one thing today, it is this. The sermon is titled, Without Holiness, and this is the fact. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And to explain that further and to go over that, we're going to go through this verse by verse as usual with me, and we're going to go through and expound and see what God has to say for us today. Beginning in verse 14, turn there in your Bibles or look and follow along in your bulletins. Verse 14, the writer of Hebrews starts out by saying, strive for peace with everyone. Now note the word strive used here. In some of your translations, if you're using a different one, it may be translated as pursue. In the previous 13 verses, the writer of Hebrews has described the Christian life as a race where you're running. So he continues in using this language and he says, strive, pursue. This is a This is an imperative verb. It is a command. There's no option here. There is no fence sitting on this. You must do this. You must strive and you must pursue. Not only is it an imperative verb, it is a continuous verb. You're not to just do it on Sunday mornings or Wednesday night Bible studies. You're to do it of every waking moment, of every single day of all time. You are to strive and pursue this peace with everyone. And in the Greek language, this word strive is a plural verb. 
So this isn't just for me to do as a minister. It isn't just for my father to do as a pastor. Striving for peace with everyone is meant for everybody to do. All of you must continuously and always strive for peace with everyone, even those that you don't like. Even when you're driving in the middle of traffic and they're going slow, you need to strive for peace in that moment. Even for those that you disagree with, that you personally don't like or don't care for too much, you are to strive for peace with that person, but that peace is not definitionless. It it is not a vague where you just celebrate and affirm everything that everyone does in the name of peace. That is not biblical peace. Peace is necessarily tied with holiness. Look at the continuing here in verse 14 as the writer goes on. Strive for peace with everyone, and so you're to strive continuously and always for this as well, and for the holiness without which No one will see the Lord. Now, I want you to note the word that is used here, the definite article, the. It says, you're to strive for the holiness. It does not say a holiness. We are not to seek peace with others through a vague sense that's definitionless, that's just, you know, like, it's like the word love. People throw out the word love, and it's like, love is love is love is love. It's just without definition anymore. That's why you see all these people making up whatever they're saying and calling it love because we've surrendered definitions. So peace and love is necessarily holy peace and holy love, as Wesley once wrote. That we, we invite and we're kind and loving to everybody, but we are calling them in our Christian walk to newness and transformation of life in Jesus Christ. That is holy love in a nutshell. And uh, uh, the, the holiness being referred to here is, is not, you know, you, you, you think of the term holiness, maybe for some of you like me, some like really weird stuff comes up. Holiness is not just worrying about who wears a skirt and who doesn't wear a skirt. Holiness is not about whether or not you only read the King James Bible. You hear that? Because you, you, everyone knows, I think everybody knows, at least someone in their family or someone, that, someone in this community who's like, well, you got to wear this. You know, all your legs got to be covered in everything all the way down to the singlest dot. And you got to only read the King James Bible because that's what Paul used. <laughs> God save us from such fallacious, silly reasoning. That is not, that is a holiness, but it is not the holiness which we are to strive for. So what is the holiness that we are to strive for? If you have your Bibles, or if you don't, just listen to me. Back a few verses in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10 says this. For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, referring to Christ disciplines us for our good, that we may share His holiness. So the holiness which we are to pursue is the holiness of Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians that we are to be imitators of Christ. Peter writes in his first letter that the one who calls you is holy, so you shall be holy in all of your conduct. Holiness is simply being more and more and becoming more and more like Christ every single day under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is the holiness which we are to strive for. And Christ has enabled us. You see, on our own, we are completely depraved, sinful human beings. But God, through His grace and through His sacrifice on the cross, has sent His Holy Spirit to us and enabled us to follow such a holiness. And this holiness is key. Because without it, as verse 14 says, you will not see the Lord. That's not just speaking of eternity. That's speaking to now, the rest of your life, and for all of eternity as well. If if we miss on this, We miss on everything. Nothing else in life matters except this. Now, 
how do we have any hope of doing this given our sinful condition? Go back for a moment to Hebrews chapter 10 in your Bibles or just listen to me here for a moment. I want to read these words. Be baptized in these words. They're wonderful. Hebrews 10, 14 through 16. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified, those who are becoming holy. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Jesus, who's traced out the law in the time of Moses on stone, has now traced it out on your heart so that you can live it out and live holy for the Lord Jesus has done that for us. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I get to talking about holiness. I get to talking about obedience of the law. And you start to ask yourself this question. Well, I've done some bad things in my life. And if I'm not holy, if I'm not striving for holiness, I ain't going to see God. So that means that I'm pretty much toast, right? Don't misunderstand me. We are not saved by what we do. We're not saved by our works. But if we're not saved by our works, then what does this text mean? It means that this this, this passage is teaching that without evidence of practical holiness in our lives, then there is no evidence that we are in Christ. See, the holiness is, is born out of a holy love that the Holy Spirit puts inside of you. So if you're not living by holiness, it is evidence to the fact that you do not have the Holy Spirit living in you and you have not been born again. You see, Jesus once said to Nicodemus, unless a man be born again, he will not see, note that word, the kingdom of God. And here the writer of Hebrews is expounding upon that a little bit further down the line. After you're born again, now he says, Without holiness, you will not see the Lord. This is the Christian truth, and I want, I want to kind of put some flesh on this word holiness because I've mentioned it several times. What exactly is holiness? Hmm. What, what is this whole thing? Hmm. We, we must, it is just very simply... It is very simply us being separate, as I already noted, from sin and separated unto God in all things. His law has been written on our hearts. His Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So we are to live and strive after him in all things. As Peter says, he who calls you, as we sang earlier today, is holy, holy, holy. Therefore, you shall be holy, holy, holy in all of your conduct. Note that that it isn't added in here. You be holy because God gives you stuff. You know, I'm going to be a good Christian today because God blessed me this week. We are not called to be holy because God does stuff for us. We are called to be holy because He is holy. God's attributes should define our life and not the stuff that happens to us. So whether you're in a bad season or a good season in life, life is good or bad, You can rejoice. Oswald Chambers once said, happiness isn't the ultimate end of man. Holiness is the ultimate end of man. And that is what we are to pursue. Now, it's separate from sin, separate under God, but what does it practically look like for this movement? For the global Methodist church movement, what does it look like for, for, for the everyday Christian, what does this pursuit and striving after holiness look like? Well, that's why we have the rest of the text here. It doesn't just stop at, Hebrew, at Hebrews 12, 14. It goes on, and the writer of Hebrews goes on in these next few verses to explain and put some skin on practical holiness. So look with me in your bulletin or in your Bibles to verse 15. See to it that... No one, pause for a second, 
Now, the writer of Hebrews is about to give us three commands, and they all begin with this phrase in the grammatical structure. See to it that no one, and here's the first one, fails to obtain the grace of God. Now, the word fails. It's another continuous verb, right? This is not describing something that happens overnight. This is, descri- this is describing a process. This is describing a, a gradual, systematic movement towards something. Uh, not obtaining the grace of God is not on a whim. It's something that is born out of a rebellious heart and a hardening of a heart towards God, and God in turn hardening that heart back. Now, what, is this, what does this phrase mean? Does not, that they don't obtain the grace of God, does that mean that the God, the God's grace doesn't go out to everybody? No. God's grace does go out to everyone. But what is being referred to here is a process by which people come to hate the grace of God. They come to hate the truth of God. They come to a point where they are totally sitting in slothfulness and they are rejecting every single thing about the grace of God. And the writer is instructing us as a church, is instructing us as individuals to see to it that we have no one in our communities that is failing to do this, that is outwardly rejecting the grace of God. And why is this important? Because what do the rest of the verse says? Because people who reject and do not obtain the grace of God cause roots of bitterness to arise in a church community. And, And before we dive into this, this is, I want you to be thinking of what has recently happened in the life of this church over the last year. We are now Benson Global Methodist Church because this passage wasn't followed correctly. And I want you to also think of your lives and how you can apply this to your lives, people that you know, and things that you can say to your family members, your coworkers, your teammates, everything along these lines. And think mostly about how this applies to you if you fit this definition. Look in verse 15. I'm going to include the first clause here. See to it that no one, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. And by it, many become defiled. Now, I want you to note that the, word, that the words root of bitterness is in quotations. Do you see that? That's because it's drawing from an Old Testament text in Deuteronomy chapter 29. We're not going to go there and we're not going to read it, but Deuteronomy 29, specifically verses 25 through 28, are referring to people who have gone against the covenant, are referring to people who have gone off and worshipped their own idols, people who have created their own gods. And it, it, that, that verse, that text in Deuteronomy pronounces how God in his wrath will uproot such bitter roots of people will remove them and cast them away from the community. The writer of Hebrews draws on this to warn us. There are many false teachers. There are many people who hate God. There are many people who are Christians who hate God. Remember I was reading a book one time. It was called The Unsaved Christian. What a title for a book. People who sociologically, you know, if you took a poll and you said you had to be Christian, most people would say, yeah, sure, I'm a Christian. But there's no holiness in their understanding of what that is. There's nothing to be added to it. It's just a basic claiming of the name of Christ. But in reality, they hate what the Bible says. They don't follow biblical ethics on topics such as sexuality, on topics such as government, and all these things, all these different things. And we're going to see it here in a moment because the third command gets really deep into this. But what, what the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us here is that we need to be ready. Because there will always be charlatans and false teachers in any movement of God that will try to rise up and ruin it. Note the word here, it springs up. It starts from within. It starts here. And then it makes its way out in the community. Look at how the previous regime is now. Look how corrupt it's gotten because people didn't take care of the bitter roots when they sprung up from the ground. Note that these bitter roots cause, what do they cause? Trouble. 
They cause trouble. As the roots grow, the trouble grows. And whenever we see a bitter root as a global Methodist church or as a Christian in our lives, we shouldn't seek to make a big tent around it. God has not called us to sit the fence. God has not called us to build a tent. As John the Baptist once said, we must lay the axe at the root and swing away at roots of bitterness. Soundly correcting and refuting them with the word of God, as Paul says in the book of Titus. Our, the youth just went through the book of Titus. That was our last study that we did was through the book of Titus. And Titus ends by talking about how we need to soundly refute people in the church. It's part of the church order. Because if we don't, there's going to be trouble. Like there is now for many churches in the United States under the band of Methodism. The verse goes on to say in verse 15 that many become defiled because of the trouble caused. There are countless amounts of people in America, and you can go, you can go, you can see it. It's pretty easy to go and find it. You just have to look. Who have been defiled because of this mistake of the church falling asleep at the wheel, allowing bitter roots and people who have not obtained the grace of God, who have rejected God, to stick around. And they've grown, and they've caused a lot of trouble. And because of it, many people have, and many people will become defiled. But it is out of that movement that God has brought forth this church, this body of people. And it is in the course of life that God brings us forth through seasons of times of, of sin, we're exposed to these great things, and he calls us to continue onward in the striving for holiness. Verse 17, or excuse me, verse 16. We have the third command here. So you're striving for peace and holiness. You're striving for holy love. You're to see that no one does not obtain the grace of God. You're to see that no root of bitterness springs up among you and causes trouble. Thirdly, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy. Pause there for a moment. In our striving for holiness, in our striving to live Christian lives in our daily lives, Wesley once wrote, the thing that this generation tolerates will be the next generation's norm. You understand that? If we just stand idly by in a big tent and we don't put the ax to the bitter root, the next generation, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will become that but normal. And you look at the world now and you say, well, I don't want to do that. Then you must strive for holiness. You must take personal initiative to get involved here at this church and whatever church you're involved in. To seek to spread scriptural holiness and obedience to the law of God across the land because without it, no one will see the Lord. Your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. What this generation tolerates, the next generation will accept. And so we have the final command. Verse 16, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau. Now, we don't have the time today to go and review the story of Jacob and Esau. If you'd like to do so during the week, go and read Genesis chapters 25 through 36 to get the whole picture of the life of Esau and sort of do a compare and contrast of what's there and what's here and how it's being interpreted thousands of years later. But, but what we see here is that Esau is being described as one who is sexually immoral. Esau had multiple wives. Not only that, but his wives celebrated and worshipped different gods. Also, he is described as one who is unholy, in contrast to the holiness which we are to strive after. You see, Esau was a man who, in verse 16, 
sold his birthright for a single meal, for a single, for a single fleeting moment of gratification. He gave up God's blessing in his life. Are we going to be the same? Not every church in America has the opportunity to become a global Methodist church that wants to. God's blessing has come upon this church, but will we be like Esau? Will we give up the birthright? Will we surrender God's blessing to us in the name of sexual immorality, in the name of unholiness? Or will we set those aside, be separate from those things, be separate unto God, and seek and strive after Him with every fiber of our being to pursue the holiness that He has allowed us to partake in? That is the question. And now, verse 17 goes on to tell us, to tell us something big here. It continues on. For you know that afterward. Now I want to take a moment to just kind of take apart these words because the rest of the verse is very simple, but these words are important. The writer now speaks to the reader. He says, for you know. These people would have known the story. They would have been very familiar with Esau. They would have been very familiar with the story of Jacob and Esau and what had happened. But, but one thing, that the reason why the writer of Hebrews is saying this whole story again that they already knew is because they knew the story, but they didn't apply the story. How much is that true of us? Non-Christians, Christians alike, many people, if you ask them, know Bible stories. They know a lot of information, but the Holy Spirit has yet to rot a physical and spiritual transformation in their lives and write that law on their hearts. It is not enough to just know information. We need to seek transformation and holiness separate from sin, separate under God. Because without that holiness, we will not see the Lord. Go on in verse 17. For you know that afterward. Pause there for a moment. The word afterward. I want us to focus on that. You guys know that after Esau messed up, after Esau, unholy and sexually immoral as he was, after he willingly gave up his blessing, his birthright, for a mere meal, he wanted it back. That's what the rest of verse 7 says. When he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. Now, many theologians have debated over this passage, and I don't really want to get into it because I don't think that's what it's talking about here. But a lot of people will bring into the conversation, well, this is where it teaches you can lose your salvation, and this is where it talks about apostasy. Now, while that issue does come up in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 6 and Hebrews chapter 10, I don't think that that is what is in view here. In fact, it's not. The repentance being referred to here is not salvific repentance. It's just Esau trying to make things right to get back the physical part of a spiritual blessing. He wanted to be king of his family. He wanted to be a prophet to the land. He wanted to do all of these things. He wanted to be entitled. But we know from the testimony of Scripture here that Esau on the inside was an unholy sexually immoral man who was in rebellion against God. He was a bitter root. He was one who had not obtained the grace of God. So, this is not talking about salvific repentance and not being able to not repent after, leaving, you know, after apostatizing or leaving the faith or something along those lines, though that issue does come up elsewhere. Note the end part here, verse 17. Though he sought it with tears... He wanted the physical blessing back. He was a man directed by his appetites, and he had blown it. And he sought it with tears. Emotions don't change things, folks. We cannot be people led solely by our emotions. We cannot be led by our appetites and what we desire. We must be led completely and wholly 
by the word of God. We must not choose harlotry over holiness. Let me say that again. We must not choose harlotry, being with the world, smelling like the world, looking like the world, doing everything the world does because it says so, because the president says so, or someone like that. could be anyone else. We must choose holiness, which is to be separate from the world and separate unto God in all things. When we see in our lives, when we, we, we go around in everyday life, you're going to see things that are contrary to the, to, to the Christian life, to holiness. And what do you do? What does it look like to strive for holiness? The holiness without which no one will see the Lord. It is simply seeking peace with that person, seeking to be kind and loving to that person, but in doing so, you are also calling them to something new. When you seek holy peace with someone, you must declare a holy war on their sin, on your sin, on all falsehood that presents itself to you. We can ha- and this is something that we can do. You're thinking to yourself, well, I can't do all of this. I can't do these things. I'm just me. I'm just Jaden. I'm just here in little Benson, North Carolina. How can I change the world? Hmm. God, God has called us to something more. And the, the reason that I know that I can walk out of here with confidence and say, I'm going to live holy to the Lord is because of the work that Jesus Christ has done. The one sacrifice through which we are perfected the one sacrifice by which the law is now written upon my heart and your hearts so that you may walk in obedience to the Lord Christ lived the holy life so that through his substitutionary death and resurrection and ascension to the throne where he now sits I can live a new life. I can live an abundant life. And while I don't have everything that some mega church pastor has in Charlotte or anything like that, I have God's Word. I have His law written on my heart. What is the global Methodist church? What is the point of the Christian life? To revive the nation. It starts right here. It starts by watch, keeping a watchful eye, a loving watchful eye over what happens in this church, in this community. Taking out the acts of holiness when we need to eliminate bitter roots and then sharing the holy love of Jesus after cutting those roots. That is the two-step process that is laid out for us here. I leave you with this thought, separate from sin, separated unto God. Does that define you? Does that define your life today? If it does not, then I would ask you for to examine yourselves. I would ask you to see whether or not you bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life of whether or not you are truly seeking and striving after holiness, of whether or not you have truly been born again, and through being born again, seeking after holiness, because without being born again and without seeking holiness, you will not see the kingdom of God. But what, because of what Jesus Christ has done, you may see His kingdom. We all sin. We all mess up. We all fall short of the glory of God. But Christ lived the holy life. He died, he rose again, so that we may be looked upon as holy and then walk in that holiness. As our closing hymn, our hymn of invitation, we're going to be singing an old hymn by John Wesley, A Charge to Keep I Have. A Charge to Keep. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Your kids won't, you won't. The nation won't. So we need to go out and spread this message, this good news 
of holiness to the nation. Let us sit and stand together. If you feel so led by the Spirit of God, you may come and pray. Receive now the benediction. Taken, paraphrased from the book of Exodus chapter 3, which we read responsively earlier. Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Remove your sandals, for you are on holy ground. Let us go from this place with the charge to keep of holiness. Take off the sandals, take off the muddy boots of the world and walk in newness of life in Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.